I used to love feeling scared. But after what I've seen, I'm just permanently numb. My friends and I often played a self-scaring game where we'd visit purportedly haunted locations at night, take pictures, move around in the dark, and try to embrace fear as deeply as possible. It was our way of getting an adrenaline rush. Some people went skydiving, and some people raced cars, but we purposely scared the hell out of ourselves. Gabby was the biggest fear junkie out of all of us. She was the one most interested in taking photographs too, as if she was intent on proving the supernatural actually existed. I didn't have the heart to tell her that I didn't actually think there was anything out there. We'd been to central hospitals, where tuberculosis patients had died in mass. We'd stayed the night in horror prisons, with the lights off. We'd even gone up to a spot in the woods where it was rumored a mass murder had taken place in the 1800s. Through all that, we'd never once seen anything out of the ordinary. It'd always been fun, though. So when the dealer at a college party offered me something new, I immediately thought of Gabby. She scoffed when I showed her the little circular dark blue pills. Remy? What the hell is Remy? Is that like... Molly? No. I said, looking around the party to make sure nobody was watching us. It's new. My guy says it puts you in a REM dream state while you're still awake. That's why it's called Remy. Her wariness faded as she realized the implications. Is it safe? I grinned. I knew I had her interest. As safe as dreaming. She grabbed our friend Kurt and we went out the door without even saying goodbye to anyone else at the party, practically salivating over the prospect of this new adventure. She rhetorically asked, What's the scariest possible place around here? Kurt, the most reluctant of our trio, shook his head. If we're really doing this Remy stuff, can we first try it somewhere normal? Uh, I don't want to freak out and get hurt or trapped or something. I nodded diplomatically. Gabby sighed. Fine. She looked up and down the orange-lit street, taking stock of the random scattered college kids on the way to and fro in the chilly night. How about here? Here? Kurt asked. Like, in public? I didn't see anybody acting crazy. Before we could all agree, she took one of the several I'd given her and downed it. Here goes nothing. Shrugging at Kurt, I took one too. And he joined in with trepidation. Nothing happened at first, and, of course, I'd forgotten to ask how long it would take to kick in. Should we walk? Let's go get sodas at the get-go, Gabby suggested. Something about her sentence felt a little odd. Was it already starting to have an effect? I walked alongside my two friends, studying the orange street lamps overhead and passers-by in the distance. That was the curious thing about dreams. You could never quite tell when they began. You were simply, and suddenly, there. Psst. I turned and saw a thin blonde girl standing in a nearby yard. She waved me over. Hey. Uh, what's up? I asked. Behind me, Kurt and Gabby turned to look at her too. The more I looked at her, the more detail seemed to become clear. Gray bottoms, a sweatshirt, a gaunt face. Wait, what? She shivered despite her warm clothes and asked, You got anything I can eat? Anything at all? I looked at Kurt, who shrugged and threw her an Altoid from his pocket. She caught it, gulped it down without chewing, sighed happily, and vanished. I'm pretty sure all of us screamed at the same time, more out of shock than fear. The triple scream seamlessly became laughter as we realized that Remy was working. We'd all just dreamed a girl standing in a yard. Kurt's Altoid sat in the grass, a tiny white speck in dark, glimmering emerald. But I was still awake, and smart enough to realize that we'd all seen the same thing. Did this drug also cause people to share the same waking dream? Or were we creating some false participatory memory? 
It was impossible to know, and our analytical abilities were deteriorating as the stoops and ramshackle undergraduate houses around us took on surreal qualities. Wake dreaming was its own class of crazy, with far more awareness than usual. I was able to see how my stream of consciousness constantly shaped and remodeled everything around me. A house ahead grew taller, reminding me vaguely of an ancient Greek temple. It morphed into a weathered ancient Greek temple, reminding me of history and old things. It became a ruin, and then a house for medieval peasants, and then a booth from the Renaissance Fair. Only once I grew close enough to really focus did it stop changing and return to normal. Dreams operated at the edge of consciousness, and direct concentration could dispel them. This is just... this is just cool. Not scary, Gabby said, looking around with wonder. Her face turned into an evil grin. So far. She began walking faster. We kept up with her, and Kurt asked, Where are we going? There's an abandoned house two blocks over. Let's break in and see how scared we can get. That definitely sounded like a plan. Traversing a maze-like landscape of sidewalks, asphalt, cars, and houses that kept consistently changing in shape, meaning, and scope, we nevertheless made decent progress straight towards our destination. We were still awake, after all, and there was always a long, narrow tube of reality where I decided to focus my eyes and awareness. We kept lookout while Gabby bashed in the low rectangular basement window with a rock. We carefully slipped down in, one by one. It was only after I stood and looked around that dark, musty basement by dull, indirect orange light that I realized I hadn't thought to look at the house's exterior. I'd been too caught up in the shifting dreamscape to get a sense of what kind of building we were climbing into. The basement itself didn't look too strange. The gray dirt floor ran uniformly around the cramped space and we investigated nooks and crannies among the stone foundations for a time by the light of our phones. Look, Gabby said excited. I followed her pointing finger to a skull partially buried in the gray dirt. Kurt laughed and poked it. Oh, it's so real. Under our collective gazes, it turned into a half-buried teapot. Ah. Gabby looked positively hungry for more. Let's go upstairs. The creaking wood under our feet was oddly dark, and I put my phone light close, trying to figure out why, but the shades and animation style of the steps kept changing, as if I was watching a movie, and then a cartoon, and then a sketch, and then a comic. I fought down a wave of nausea and looked around, hoping that this trip wasn't about to turn bad. I froze at the top of the stairs. Oh, sorry. Four people stood within. A woman at the sink a man at the fridge, and two kids sitting at the kitchen table. They all stood unmoving and stared at the three of us blankly, likely too shocked to react. Kurt held up his hands. Oh God, wrong house. Gabby stood between us, also warily still. I expected the father to call the cops, or the kids to scream, or the mother to angrily shoo us out of the house, but none of them moved. As always, Gabby was the first to suspect that something was wrong. She stepped to the side at first just once, but then twice, and a third time. The family of four turned their heads and gazes to follow her, but none of them spoke a word or otherwise moved. What the hell is this? Kurt asked, gripping my upper arm tightly. The mother turned her gaze on him, her expression still blank. Don't swear. I whispered to him, keeping my eyes on the family while I slowly followed Gabby. There are children present. I didn't care where we were going, only that we were going somewhere else. As such, we were halfway up the next oddly darkened steps before I realized we were not heading for some sort of split-level exit. I hissed, Gabby, we can't go upstairs. The people here... She turned and looked back at me. A what? She whispered. This place burned down two months ago. I kept looking at her, but my thoughts went to the dark stairs and walls. They were blackened, 
I now understood because they were charred. And the family in the kitchen. Kurt's grip on my arm became painful. What the hell is going on? Why am I dreaming of a family that died here? He looked up at both of us fiercely. I didn't know about any dead family beforehand. It's the dream state, Gabby said with visible excitement. We must be seeing things outside of normal perception. She turned and made a move down the second floor hallway. I caught her arm, and for a moment all of us were physically connected. Gab? If that's true, it's time to go home. Study this until we know more. Are you kidding? She pulled away, breaking contact. What if this is a one-time deal, an accident of timing and biology? These are the big leagues. This is what we've always looked for. She darted off, disappearing into the shifting darkness and shade of the surreal second floor hallway. Kurt let go, fleeing in the other direction, back down the stairs. I, I can't. I'm sorry. I just can't. Torn and suddenly alone. I watched Kurt swing around the charred banister pole at the bottom of the stairs and run out of sight. And then I turned to face the shifting and uncertain hallway. I had to believe Kurt would be all right, since he was heading for the front door. Gabby, on the other hand, was heading deeper into a place where the living very much did not belong. I stepped forward into a swaying sense of subtle dizziness that hung about the second floor proper. It took a few moments before the slow back and forth and eerie creaking made sense. A boat! It felt like I was in the narrow hall of a boat. But on what ocean were we drifting? The phone in my hand had become a small torch burning with a dim white flame, and I held it before me as I cautiously opened the first door. It creaked horribly and then splintered away, too charred to function. A low rumble echoed through the hallway, and I slipped within the burnt room feeling like I'd just barely avoided some sort of gaze or awareness coming around a distant corner. I leaned back against the wall, breathing hard but quietly, telling myself that it was just a dream and one that I'd, I'd had often. For that matter, throughout much of my life, in dreams, I'd fled that unhallowed awareness just around the corner, always diving for safety just before... It learned of my existence. But now, it was here. My breathing stilled as I finally cast my sight around the room. Dolls! God, why dolls? A good forty odd, eerie little dolls with charred faces sat littered about the faded pink room, and various pieces their eyes fixated on me from every angle. I stared, my pulse growing into a roar in my head until I was finally forced to breathe again, but they all seemed too damaged by the fire to move, and then beyond them a soot stained window that showed out only onto dark emerald fog. The subtle motion of our surreal ship became prominent in my limbs again, and I inched my way around the room to stare out through those darkened panes. Limitless black waters roiled just below, at about the height of the first floor's ceiling, so it was just the second floor and above that were partially in another world. Then I ducked down behind the bed, hiding among the glaring broken dolls as the awareness in the hallway brushed again. It paused on the broken door and perhaps even gazed in with some monstrous eye, but I dared not look. Satisfied that the room was empty, whatever it was out there finally moved on. I gave it a good long minute before I climbed back on my feet and crept out into the hallway. Where had it gone? the way back. The stairs down were gone, replaced by a window into green fog and dark waters. No matter. Gabby was the other direction, and I knew her well enough to skip the rest of the doors on the second floor. She would be heading straight for the attic. It was about that moment, staring at the slightly open door to another set of upward stairs, that I began feeling more clear-headed. Looking back, I saw two images, one fading and one growing stronger. The horrible, otherworldly hold I had crept down, 
and a gaping burnt shell of a house with no solid second floor to speak of. I stood on an overhanging ledge of charred wood which was physically unreachable from the stairs in the distance. Implicitly, I understood in that moment that I was not just dreaming. The dream state had actually let us tread into something deeper, some dark blister on reality that had bubbled and festered into its own little nightmare. And in the real world, the attic door was closed and locked. God damn it, Gabby, I muttered. Not that there was a choice, considering that I had no normal way down from my high, unstable location. I took another of the little circular dark blue pills from my pocket and swallowed it. I waited, breathless. The swaying and the creaking returned rather quickly, and I began to lose sight of the real. Near my hand, the attic door was both closed and open. And then just open. Set loose like a runner at the start line, I pulled it the rest of the way and sprinted up the stairs, scared by how long I had left Gabby on her own. The white torch snuffed out as I moved straight up into a horizontal ceiling of absolute darkness that hovered level with the top of the attic stairs. I crouched to avoid nails that might be sticking down from the roof. The expansive space ran cool with draft from the ocean air outside, and I used those drafts to inch along through the void. I felt melted plastic, soot, and charred wood with my fingers as I moved. This was still the burnt-out attic, so why was it so impossibly dark? Gabby's whisper came from somewhere out in the abyss. He's here. I found her. Mostly. Who? Who? I whispered back. The older brother who set the fire. I froze in the dark taking in her meaning. Was he? She shrieked suddenly, and then I heard wood creak and motion erupt from somewhere ahead of me to my right. Crawling forward and grimacing from fear of nails, I sought out the noise of struggle and managed to grasp her flailing hand. She knew it was me immediately and pulled hard to escape something and crawl past me. I was too slow. Painfully, hot fingers that held the texture of overcooked hot dogs gripped my ankle, and my kicks did no damage to whatever my shoes were striking. A horrible stench hit my nose, barely perceiving a charred corpse climbing on top of me. Grappling with the nightmarish arsonist, I fought with dreamlike strength. That is to say, none. For every hit felt like I was doing nothing at all. My efforts to fight back held no impact. The idea came to me in a flash out of my own fears. Instead of fighting off the unseen horror, I gripped his front and side and stood up as fast as I could. He groaned, gurgled, and convulsed, and foul-smelling goo hit my face from above. I didn't need to see him to know what I'd done. Letting go, I moved away, free to leave now that he was pinned to the roof by dozens of jutting nails that had been several inches long each. Don't... He choked out, audibly distraught. Don't leave me here. Don't let it have me. Forgive me. Let me go. We're almost there. Please. You have no idea. I ignored him. Gabby followed my hand in the darkness, and we crawled our way to some sort of exit, but it was not the stairs back down. We emerged through a small hatch onto the deck of the nightmarish ship proper. Here, the green fog was thickest, lit only by a special glow from an unseen moon. Above us, a wooden platform rose to a crest, and on that platform, a figure in silhouette stood at the wheel. That silhouette's head and shoulders shifted as it slowly turned to look at us, Then I found myself unable to move at all. No matter how hard I tried, the effort only produced a subtle dark blue static along the outlines of my limbs. We remained on our hands and knees. Two dark red points, like zero-dimensional rubies with endless depth, studied us for a moment. Were we going to die? Was it going to kill us? Who or what was it? 
We'd crawled through a dead family's unending nightmare and a child arsonist's private hell to find... What? The ruby eyes shifted away, facing ahead again, and I was suddenly able to move. I began to point straight ahead at some distant approaching destination. The emerald fog around us rolled in a new breeze and began to slide away. I pulled Gabby back towards the hatch, but she resisted. Her eyes gleamed by spectral moonlight. Don't do it, I whispered but she crawled out of my immediate grasp as I remained at the hatch back to the real world. She pulled out the handful of dark blue pills I'd given her and downed them all in one determined gulp. I have to know! I screamed at her, but she clambered to her feet and began to ascend the lay of the ship towards the figure. I thought to go after her still, even then, but I felt it coming over the waves. That awareness, larger and closer than ever, no longer just a stalking shadow of itself, but real, present, and growing nearer. Every almost encounter with it I'd ever had in dreams had been nothing but avoiding the smaller shiver of that ultimate terror which lay ahead in this dark ocean. I knew then that if I had ever failed to avoid it knowing of me, that if I had ever gone around those dreamscape corners just a little bit slower and gotten seen in the utmost indescribable sense, I would have died in my sleep or worse. <laughs> crying. I was crying. I could actually feel a shadow of my future in my mind generated by my dream state. I could crawl back into that hatch and let Gabby find out what she'd been seeking ever since her parents had died and nobody in my world would ever see her again. I would live the rest of my life wondering if she was suffering an unimaginable fate all alone and in God knew wherever this was. It was coming up over the waves. Seconds. Heartbeats. We had mere moments. Screaming silently in my mind, I abandoned my grip on the hatch and ran up the charred wood of that ghastly ship and tackled her. She struggled and bit and clawed at me, but I dragged her away. There was no time for going back the way we'd come. A rising scream that shook the world reached a crescendo as the ship tilted up along a massive wave preceding the unknowable beast. The waters were dark enough to hide us from its sight, and that would have been enough. With an instinctual prayer expressed by a leap of my heart in my chest, I pulled her over the side with me, and we plunged down into the icy pitch. And through it. Down onto hard, autumn-chilled grass, where her legs snapped like a twig and my arm shattered in four places. Of course, we could never truly explain to anyone why we jumped off the roof of that burnt-out house. Kurt swore that his pill had worn off by the time he saw us fall out of thin air. I did my best to convince him that it was the last effect of his dream state. My pills. I ground up underneath my shoe while I painfully waited for the ambulance to arrive. I sat by her side in the hospital, at least as much as they let me. With no parents and no family, I was her emergency contact and the confused doctor explained that he honestly had no idea what was wrong with her. She was unresponsive and wouldn't wake up. But unlike a coma patient, her brain activity was consistently very high. Coma patients never experience REM sleep, almost by definition, but she was always in it and exhibiting signs of extreme stress besides. He'd never seen anything like that. But I knew what it was. I'd only saved her body. She'd overdosed on dreams and fear. The rest of her was still there in that nightmarish layer of reality. What she might have found, I'll never know. But I no longer enjoy fear. I've seen where it comes from. Nearly touched its source directly. Nearly had it become aware of me personally in return. And I have absolutely no desire to go back there before I see death a second time. 
and he drags me kicking and screaming into his inescapable moth.